All right, thank you very much. Um, I find it almost impossible to reconcile the severe penalties imposed by the NCAA for the violations det detailed in today's report. The NCAA agreed that Lamont Evans acted alone and for his own benefit. The NCAA also agreed that OSU did not benefit in recruiting, commit a recruiting violation, did not play an ineligible player, and did not display a lack of institutional control. They said OSU cooperated throughout the entire process. In short, OSU did the right thing. On the other hand, Lamont Evans' conduct damaged an OSU player, damaged the men's basketball team, and damaged the university. He acted selfishly and without regard for those student athletes who trusted him or the university that employed him all for personal gain. Given this context, how does the NCAA justify a postseason ban and the loss of three scholarships for violations that damaged the university and basketball program? Penalties that are normally reserved for those seeking a, a substantial or extensive recruiting or competitive advantage. I'm shocked by the ruling today and determined to vigorously fight against this injustice. OSU has strived to do the right thing during this process, and all we expected in return was for the NCAA to reciprocate. If this is what happens when there is no competitive advantage gain, then the NCAA has created an expectation of significantly harsher penalties when a competitive advantage is involved. All of us that are members of the NCAA will be watching to see if these standards and expectations are applied consistently. And that's, the, that's my remarks, Kevin. Thank you, Coach. At this time, next will be Mike, my Coach Mike Boynton. Uh, coach, before we get to questions, can you please share some of your thoughts? I uh, hope everybody can hear me. Uh, we can hear you, Coach. I sit here extremely frustrated, um, really disappointed uh, for this program, but most importantly for the, the players in our program many of which weren't a part of our program when this began and have absolutely very minimal knowledge of anything that even happened in this case. Um, I, I feel badly for them. And I certainly hope that through the appeals process, we can understand more how terribly impactful this can be to their careers and their futures. That's it. Thanks, Coach. At this time, we'll take questions from members of the media. Uh, if you have a question to ask, please click the raise hand button and we'll get right to you. Uh, before asking your question, though, please just indicate who your question is for between Coach Holder, Coach, Bur Coach Boynton, and Chuck Smart. Our first question comes from Nathan. Nathan, floor is yours. There we go. You got me. I can hear you, Nathan. Go ahead. This is for Coach Boynton. Coach, you obviously have the top basketball recruit in the country who's widely considered a one-and-done guy. You've got a top five overall recruiting class. How do you keep those guys together and keep them coming to OSU whenever you get news like this? Um, Nathan, I appreciate the question. Uh, I'll say this. I made a great effort when I got the news this morning to call every single player on our roster returning and incoming. And there's obviously a little bit of confusion and concern on their part, and rightfully so. Um, I'm going to be here to support any decision that any of them decide to make. And I told them that directly. Um, most of them know me really well because <clears throat> I personally recruited most of them myself. So to have that conversation with them and tell them that next season could look a lot different than they anticipated wasn't easy, but it was necessary. And so I sit here telling you that that conversation with all of them was, um, 
was difficult and challenging. And for Kate in particular, because I'm sure he's the top of everybody's mind, um, you know, we're going to do everything we can to support him, just like we were all the other guys. Whatever the best option is for him, we're going to support 100% without any reservations. I told him that. And um, I look forward to having an opportunity at some point uh, because of the situation we're in now, not being able to see these guys face to face um, makes it a little more challenging. So um, I'll continue to stay in contact with them regularly. Um, but I, I certainly feel confident in the relationships that we have built over the course of time that we'll get to a place where whatever decision is best for those kids, all of them, including Kate, uh, will be what happens. Thank you, Coach. Our next question comes to us from Robert Allen. Robert, can you hear us? All right, Robert, we'll come back to you. Uh, our next question is from Jenny Carlson of the Oklahoman. Yes. Hey, uh, Mike Boynton, I was hoping you could address this. Um, two things. First of all, can you just talk about and tell us how you got the news today about the sanctions? Um, how did you how did you come to know that news? Where were you? Uh, how did that all go down? And then secondly, something that um, Coach Holder referenced, the, the uh, cooperation that you all gave um, to the NCAA. And now to have these level of penalties, um, do you question the decision to have helped or do you say, you know what, we had to do that? Two questions, not exactly related, but I'm hoping you can address both. Now, I'll go with the second one first because um, it's probably easier. I, I don't really try to live in hindsight too often. It's probably a little dangerous to go down that path. Um, so I, I think we tried to do the right thing at the end of the day. So um but as far as how this all went down, um, I was anticipating around sometime around this time of year. I did never get a real definitive answer on when we'd know what the final decision was. Uh, but I got an email this morning uh, sometime around 920 or so um, that the report was in uh, and I was going to be needed to be at a meeting in the near future. So I got up to the office as quickly as I can because obviously everybody's kind of working in a unique capacity right now. Um, and so I heard the news uh, and it's finally finality about 10 AM, give or, give or take a few minutes. And then um, the, the first thing that came to my mind was our players. And because I heard that the news would be being released around 11 central time. And there was no way I was going to allow the media to tell our players what was going on with their lives. And so I started calling them immediately. Was there something else to, for me to answer there? I don't, I'm not sure. No, that's it. Thanks, Coach. Thanks, Coach. Our next question comes to us from Bill Haston of the Tulsa World. Uh, for really for coach for both coaches, Coach Mike or uh, Coach Boynton and Coach Holder. What before today? What was the range of your expectations? What did, and, and I guess what I'm asking is what was what in your minds? What was the worst case scenario? Uh, because I, it just feels like. Uh, the level of of shock that you guys have expressed that you never you didn't see this coming at all. So, what was your uh, I guess the range of your expectations on the NCAA response and, and maybe your worst case scenario before today? Well, I'll take a stab at it. Um, I guess we didn't really ever know. I think our gut feeling was that we tried to do the right thing <clears throat> throughout the process. So Coach Evans was um, let go from the university within three days, I believe, of hearing about this news. And at that point, we needed to find out if there was any other problems in the program. And so all the investigations were done, and there weren't. There were no players here who had been recruited illegally. We didn't have any players here living in the wrong place or driving cars that didn't belong to them. We didn't have any of the stuff that you've seen or heard as being egregious violations of NCAA rules. And so we feel like we felt good about going in and telling, hey, this was unfortunate that a person in our program was acting 
uh, and a behavior that is counterproductive to what we're trying to do as a department. But now we've, we've dealt with it. And so we felt like going in and expressing that would, would give us a chance to at least come out with the penalties that would align with those actions. And we are clearly long ways away from those two things being aligned with one another. This activity started in 2015 from the FBI standpoint, uh, at which time no one even at the university, period, was involved. And so to get to a place where that person arrives at the university, continues that activity, and then is subsequently fired because of it, no one else is you know, accountable to it. My name isn't mentioned one time in this report at any given time in the last three years. My name has never come up in any of this stuff. Um, so I was I was thoroughly disappointed with the way the NCA decided to hand out you know, penalties that will certainly impact people's lives who had absolutely nothing to do with this case. And so, you know, maybe um, probation, I could see. Uh, maybe some reduction in recruiting activities, even though there was no recruiting violations here. I could probably get around, justify that in my mind. Um, but in terms of a postseason ban for a group of kids who were probably 15 and 16 years old when this stuff was going on, is completely, completely out of bounds. Thank you, Coach. Our next question comes to us from Robert Allen. Yeah, I apologize. I was on a computer without a microphone, so I'm 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 in now. Chuck Smirt, uh, the both questions I have are for for Chuck. In his vast experience in dealing with this, when you have an institution that had no ill-gotten gain in recruiting, it was not an academic violation. There wasn't a citing for lack of institutional control. How surprised was he with the uh, with the penalties? And the second question. In the judicial system, you're judged by a jury of your peers. And in reading the committee that dealt with this, with the exception of a former athletic director at Minnesota, this is kind of the complaint of Power Five schools, Chuck. This this wasn't your peers. Okay, then, well, thank you for the question. Let me address the, the first part of that. I think it's a mistake for this case to be portrayed somehow as the university cooperated and then it, but it still received significant penalties. The institution participated in this process and it contested several things along the way. The most important thing that was contested in fact, the sole purpose of going to the hearing was to contest the enforcement staff's contention that this was a, a level one case. The institution contested some aspects of the allegation and in fact, won most all of those aspects of contesting those part, the part of the allegation. But the whole purpose of the hearing basically was to contest that this was level one. So once the committee came back and said level one, then they looked at those level one type of penalties. We thought we did a very good job before the committee. We thought the committee was very responsive to our argument. Ultimately, they were not. As a result, this is what, what uh, the, the, the resulting penalties. Now, as it relates to the composition of the committee, there are, our panel was a cross section of those individuals from NCAA schools. And, and I know this sounds rote, but the, the NCA is composed of presidents, ADs, faculty, athletic representatives, and due to concerns from the public, public members. So this committee had a cross section. I think this committee was, as far as position wise, 
representative of what most Committee on Infractions panels look like. I, I guess going back, going back more specifically then, does the association need to change the composition of a committee to have only coaches or to have only athletic directors? I, you, you can argue those types of things, but it had, a, it had people who are representative of institutions who are members of the NCAA. Gavin, can I follow that up? Sure. Yeah, I, and I wasn't complaining about the positions. Presidents are fine and, and uh, members of, of uh, you know, boards of regents and, and people from society outside athletics. I'm fine with that. But the people who were involved from athletics weren't from Division I Power 5 schools. I think this has been a constant complaint. There are different ways of doing business and schools are different. Vermont is has very little in common with Oklahoma State when it comes to the way the athletic departments are run, and that that that's and maybe I'm seeing too much into it, and you can straighten me out on that. Well, I understand that thinking, and and I think it has some it has some credibility. The issue here was not a matter of of any type of factual dispute or how something should be operated at a different le- at a certain level but uh again the, the only issue was penalty and to the extent that an institution that has less student athletes and sports than Oklahoma State understands or doesn't understand the impact of a penalty i think that's a that's a that's a question that that can be asked. Thank you. Our next question comes from Garen Emig of the Tulsa World. Go ahead, Garen. Sorry, uh, Mike Boynton, please. Um, if, if I could take you back to your out of the box statement about how you're most upset for your kids, your players, and ask you two things, uh, just about the general penalty process and something like this. It, is it fundamentally flawed when when kids and players who, as you as you mentioned, had nothing to do with the infractions are the ones who bear the brunt of the punishment? Uh, because this this has happened over time. This isn't just in, in your particular case, but this is an instance that's that's occurred time and time again. Number two, is there a way around it, or is that just inevitable? Uh, I would contend that there has to be a way around it. There must be a way around it because even the bad actors aren't punished in these cases. And I made it a point, I wasn't involved in this at any point in any capacity whatsoever. And neither was any of the 13 guys who we've committed scholarships to for the 2020-21 season where the postseason ban is supposed to come and play. So fundamentally, it's flawed. And in any other way you want to describe it, it's flawed and it must change. Do you have, can I ask a follow-up? Yeah. Go ahead, Garen. Do you, Mike, do you have any ideas on how to do that? Or, do, or if you even, is that, are you not going there yet? No, I think we need to go there as soon as we can. Um, because if it doesn't, then we're going to see more of these cases adjudicated in a way that harms the people who our, our industry is supposed to care for. So I don't have the answers for you today. Uh, I'm still kind of numb from the news, but I will be working really hard to try to figure them out very soon. Thanks, Karen. Uh, Bill Hasten, I cut you off before Coach Holder could answer your last question. Um, go ahead and, and chime right in, Bill. Okay, uh, for Coach Holder, yes. Uh, 11 months ago, Stan Wilcox of the NCAA made a pretty strong comment that suggested that uh, the hammer was going to drop pretty hard. And 
That was 11 months ago. So did that put you on guard at the time when he said, this is a great opportunity for the enforcement staff, the committee on infractions, et cetera, uh, to put things back where they need to be. Did, did that, when, when he said that, did it, did it put you on guard and, and maybe indicate to you that, um, that you might have an undesirable outcome? Well, first of all, when he said that, I applauded it. Um, something needs to be done, has needed to be done for a long time to clean up the sport and get rid of the bad actors. But given the circumstances and the facts in our case, I didn't think that set us up for the penalty that we got today. When we went to the appeals hearing that Chuck Smart alluded to, uh, we didn't agree as an institution that Lamont Evans – what he did was, yeah, level one for Lamont Evans. Yeah, aggravated or for Lamont Evans, absolutely. But not level one for Oklahoma State University. We were a victim. And uh, so we felt like it was more level two. But certainly, and, and not everybody on this call is familiar with all the different standards within these levels. But if, if it did move to level one, there are three uh, categories in level one. There's aggravation, there's standard, there's mitigation, and standard, which is what they applied to us today. Uh, it has a matrix that shows you the penalties that are at your disposal. And it you just read across the sheet and it said, well, one to two years postseason ban. Well, I don't think that what happened at our school uh, deserved standard classification. I think it's more mitigation. And the options available, if, if it's mitigation, is zero postseason years for a ban or up to one. And then it, the same standard dropped down, and you talk about scholarship reductions, it reduces the expectation for scholarship reductions. So I think the facts, and I still believe this, support a level two on the part of the institution. If it moves to level one, then at most it's the mitigation level and we shouldn't receive a postseason ban. So I, I had a problem with the options back in February when we had the hearing. I still have them today and I'm befuddled that that committee came to the conclusion that they did and uh, the penalties that they handed down for us. Now it's our uh, responsibility to deal with this and uh, we will appeal it. Uh, and then, depending on what that uh, happens at the appeal, our real challenge is how we deal with this today and going forward with our student athletes and for our university. That's my number one concern now. Coach Holder, 15 weeks ago, this looked like it might be one of the great years ever for Oklahoma State. You, you had a big, uh, a big month ahead of you in tennis with hosting uh, Big 12 and NCAA. Uh, you were going to open a ballpark. You had great momentum with men's basketball. Uh, wrestling signed a great class. Football's got momentum, et cetera. And then now, fit, now here we are in early June, and it's just you've just been staggered by one uh, cancellation or one set of circumstances after the other. Can can you just talk about that a little bit? Just what this last three months has been like in, within the athletic department at Oklahoma State. Well, you know, and then I'd add to that the, the fact that we're supposed to, we're scheduled to host the cross country national championship. And you know how challenging it is to get a, an NCAA championship on your campus. There are very few sports that are the, are the right size for that to happen in this day and age. So extraordinary opportunity to host men's and women's tennis and cross country men and women all in the same year. And it's catastrophic. And, and I'm, Maybe that's too big a word. How disappointing it's been to have all the things happen to us that you just alluded to. But then you take what's happened to our country with uh, the coronavirus and the reaction to that, the loss of life, um, and then the fact that we've shut down our nation's economy and we've had at one point in time 33 million plus people unemployed in our country. Uh, the e economic devastation of that. And then what's happened recently in Minnesota and with race relations with our country and how that's come to the forefront, I guess, and, and really trumped all of this. So uh, 
yeah, you uh, 2020 hasn't had a great start. Uh, we're almost to the halfway point, July 1. My hopes and prayers there are that the last two quarters, the last half of 2020, are a whole lot better than the first half, Bill. All right, Coach, thank you. Our next question comes from Barry Trammell of the Oklahoman. Go ahead, Barry, you have the floor. Hey, guys, uh, both, both Mike. Is, is this a case of you've got to be more diligent than ever now on, on who you hire and who you put on your staff? Um, even even without this penalty, I think this whole process probably made you think this, but if this is going to be the result, is it more more important than ever to try to figure out who who you've got working for you? I'll, I'll take a stab at that. Um, I don't think it, Barry, I don't think it necessarily makes it more important. We've always understood the responsibility that comes along with hiring and um, you know, the things that have always resonated with me are the personal qualities. That's what I look for in a leader when you hire a coach. You're looking for someone that you would want your son or daughter to play for, to be around. You want some, someone that can make a difference from them in their lives. You want someone that stands for the right things, honesty, integrity, a strong work ethic, ethic all that. And I don't care what amount of due diligence you do, I think you would be hard pressed to find out these things that cropped up, for example, about Lamont Evans. You couldn't find anything in his resume or in his past that animated any issues with the NCAA. Uh, I was shocked. I'm sure Mike was shocked. You know, Mike's known him for quite a while and had a lot of respect for him. So I think it's just the nature of life today, life in general. Uh, unfortunately, we have some flawed individuals in every aspect of society today. And uh, no matter how much, how, how good a job you try to do or how strong your, uh, your background checks are, mistakes will be made. And then you unfortunately have to deal with the consequences, Barry. If I would just follow up, I would say, Barry, that uh, I think we are thorough. Um, I don't think we overlook things in that process. Um, but you're not going to find out everything, right? Obviously, this is something that was going on in, in secrecy from a lot of people. And this has affected a lot of people's lives, um, and not just our program, but some others. So. Um, I, I would agree. You need to be as thorough as you can, but I, I feel like we have a good process in going through those things. Our program. So I agree, but I, I do think we are fairly thorough in, in, in those regards. Thanks, guys. Our next question comes from Myron Metcalf of ESPN. Go ahead, Myron. Uh, this is uh, for Mike. Um, you said you had a chance to talk to Kay Cunningham. We've obviously heard so much about this G League uh, program that's starting up and uh, just other opportunities that might be out there. What did he convey to you about how he's feeling about sticking with his commitment or possibly pursuing his pro options? Yeah, so so I'll say this. Is, is, it, was, it was not a long conversation, unfortunately. I'm going to talk to him again. Um, because the timing of it, Myron, just didn't present an opportunity for me to have an in-depth conversation with any of these guys. Uh, as, as important as Cade is and has been to me for the last several years and would be to our program if he plays here, there are 12 other guys that I needed to make sure that they heard from me as well. Um, so it was a short conversation. Uh, I think he was appreciative that he heard it from me. I think he admires at least that we've got a strong enough relationship that I wouldn't try to hide anything from him. Um, but what I, well, I'll tell you what I told him. I didn't spend four years recruiting him and telling him how much I cared about him to now abandon what's important for him. And so we're going to have conversations over the next few days, probably weeks, and we're going to try to look at all the options, whatever they are, uh, G League, overseas, another university, stay at Oklahoma State, and at the end of the day, whatever his family and he decide is best for his future, 
I'm going to get right in, in, in tow with that and I'm going to support it 100%. Thanks. Our next question comes from Matt Norlander of CBS. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, I don't know if this is better served for Chuck Smart or Mike Holder, but I did want uh, a little bit of clarity um, in terms of the ambitions of the university right now when it comes to the appeal process. Uh, I consulted with an NCAA guideline that shows how long these things usually uh, take to resolve themselves and was wondering if there's any kind of foresight as to whether you want to wrap this up as soon as possible regardless, or if an appeal process can push this out a year. Uh, to be frank, you have a generational talent in your program at the moment, and if you are able to capitalize with an NCAA tournament run with Kate in the program, I think that might have an impact on uh, on some of your um, some of the way you're handling this going forward. So if you could just address the appeals process and if you have any sort of uh, foresight as to how long you think it will take and if it will definitely be resolved this year or could drag into early 2021. Chuck, uh, you can answer that one. Okay. Yeah. I the, think Chuck would be better to answer that question. Well, an institution has the opportunity to appeal a penalty, all, all or, or some penalties. If you appeal it and there's a 15 day window that starts in this case today for the school to desert to say it's going to appeal what, what component, the finding or, or a certain penalty. Once that happens, that penalty is stayed at that time. And then the process begins. And that process um, often takes, takes a while. And, and you, you can look at the appellate process and other cases that took a substantial amount of time. Uh, Coach Holder has said it's the institution's uh, intention to appeal what specific component of the penalty? Uh, I don't know if he has said that, but that that would be the process. If if a penalty is appealed, it is stayed at that point. Matt, is that what you were looking for? Um, to a certain extent, but I, I mean, I, I understand that process, but I'm just wondering if the university uh, would prefer to drag this out into February or, or early March and in doing so effectively keep its team eligible for the tournament in 2021. And, you know, if it were to lose anyway, push this back a year, or if it's just, we're going to appeal no matter what, and we'd rather have answers sooner than later. And if it winds up being this year, then that that's it. I just wonder if there, I, I know it's early. I mean, we, you've been dealing with this for like three hours, but I do think from your fan base's perspective, this now becomes one of the biggest questions is, okay, they're going to appeal, but is this thing going to drag out? And if so, might that have influence on the, say, Kate Cunningham or any other players' decisions uh, in regards to staying with the program? Uh it's Mike Holder. I'll, I'll address that. And this is just my opinion. We haven't had an opportunity to get together as a leadership team at Oklahoma State, craft a strategy. So when I say appeal, I want to appeal. I'm speaking personally. And the appeal would have nothing to do with what you just talked about. That might be a result. But we would want to appeal this because we disagree with the postseason mm -hmm. ban. And we disagree with the loss of three scholarships over three years. We think we don't think that was fair. That don't, we don't think that was justified given the nature of the infractions. And we want to contest that. We wouldn't feel good about ourselves if we just let this go by the wayside and accepted it. So we're not going to do that. I can't tell you how what the percentages are for success on this. I just know that I feel as the athletic director that we've been wrong in this case, and we want to stand up and fight for what we believe is right. We've continually done the right thing throughout this process. I, I, I commend our head basketball coach for standing for the right things. And then I also always refer back to Boone Pickens, who's our, been our number one benefactor, who gave us $165 million back in 2005. And all that he asked in return is that we play by the rules. And so we take that very seriously. We want to play by the rules. We want to do things the right thing around here. And that'll be the basis for our appeal. And hey, Matt, I'm going to add to that. Just 
from the player standpoint, yeah, I'm not going to allow any player to get screwed in this process. That's not going to happen. So any player who stays with our program will, will do it with their eyes wide open as to what exactly is going on. Um, they'll understand that there's a risk involved. For instance, you know, a lot of talk has been about Cade. I've also got a grad transfer committed and signed to come to our university. So it wouldn't since be his only opportunity to play college basketball, his last opportunity. And so those conversations are going to be real and thorough. And I'm going to make sure that we guide them and help them make the best decision. And if it's the case that they want to be at Oklahoma State, then we're going to support that as well. But if we're not going to screw these kids over again after what has already happened. Gentlemen, thank you. Our next question is from Billy Witz of the New York Times. Go ahead, Billy. Billy, are you there? Yeah, is that hello? Yep, we can hear you, Billy. Go ahead. Okay, great. This is for Mike Holder. Um, yeah, I'm just, you know, in the, when you look at the, uh, you know, federal corruption scheme, uh, and, and all that, this was, you know, relatively on the light side for some of the things that were, uh, you know, alleged to, have, or not alleged, but that, uh, you know, did go on and were adjudicated. And, you know, I'm wondering if, if you think this, you, I, I think you kind of hinted at this in your opening remarks, but if this is, do you believe that kind of, if this is the standard and this, your penalties are, you know, upheld, then, you know, I don't know, some of these other schools, the Kansases and, and, and such, uh, you know, how should they view what happened today? Well, uh, that, that's a broad question. Uh, goodness, I don't really know the, the best way to respond to that other than, uh, as I said in my opening remarks, given what happened in our case, that it was an isolated individual acting selfishly, uh, no advantage gained or ever intended to be gained for the university. He was out to, to better himself at the expense of the institution and the student athletes that he was charged to lead. And so if, if this is the result of behavior like that, where we didn't look for an advantage in recruiting, a competitive advantage, nothing like that, there's no facts out there to support any, support any of that, and then you see the severity of this penalty, goodness, what, what's the next thing to come down the pipe? And I'll be fascinated to watch. And there is an expectation on our part. And I think that everyone at our institution and then all the member schools at the NCAA that, that the, the, uh, the, our governing body has set a standard uh, of expectation involved with this level of circumstance some of the other cases that are yet to be uh, adjudicated or heard have several more egregi egregiously egregious uh, violations. Multiple level one violations have been alleged, at least what I've led publicly. That's all I know is what I read in the newspapers. So, uh, yeah, I think it, I think the expectation on our part is if, if this is unheld for us, upheld for us, then there should be some significant penalties coming down in the future. And Gavin, Gavin, I, I might weigh in on that also. Go ahead, Chuck. Mm -hmm. the, I think it goes to the intent of the, the nature of the violations. If, if you look at the cases nationally, I believe they can be fit, fit into one of two categories, what I would call the assistant coaches cases, which this is where there was a, an alleged intent to obtain personal gain, activities done for personal interest, personal gain. Some of the other cases at least alleged to have been involved in, in gaining institutional advantage. And it appears that uh, 
if this is the state that this is the standard being established for those cases that have intent for personal gain. Um, so uh, obviously this and all of you will look at this and try to fit in how this applies to the other cases. But this, in my mind, it goes back to intent. What was the intent? And the committee used very strong language in here that, that the involved coach did this for personal gain. And I wanted to comment also about uh, the question about the uh, Stan Wilcox's comments. The, uh, I don't believe the Committee on Infractions imposed this penalty because an individual at the NCA made a public comment. I think what the Committee on Infractions did was looked nationally at what was occurring and believed that though as a result of, of the visibility of all of these cases, is do we need to send a message? Oak State was the first one up and the committee appears to be sending a message as it relates to the classification of this case. And I know we've talked about that in the past. This case got classified as level one when the intent of the violation was for personal gain. So I think that's the, the, the question, I guess, that should be looked at with the other cases. What was the intent? The committee came out clearly, this involved coach was intended to get personal gain. And as, the, as it was noted, some of these activities even occurred prior to coming to the university. Chuck, I, I, yeah, I just wanted to follow up a little bit on the, I mean, are, are you, I mean, as somebody who knows this subject very well, I mean, are you aware of any other cases where, um, you, you know, I guess a, you know, a precedent of some sort, because it, it feels like, uh, you know, whether it was a lone wolf or, you know, something that was systemic, that, you know, schools are required to own it, and, uh, you know, to a large degree. So, uh, you know, are there any other examples where, uh, you know, you can point to that, uh, where there were, there, where it wasn't classified as something as a, uh, you know, a standard level one, because uh, was, it, somebody was doing this for their own personal enrichment? I think in in my research over the past two hours since since we've got this information, most of the cases that had similar penalties, it, it appeared from reading the the summaries that there was an intent to for there was significant there was an intent or there was a gain for competitive or recruiting advantage. You did not see that here. So I think this is ab abnormal in the sense of the, the level of penalty for the insignificant level of, com of competitive or recruiting advantage. Okay. Our next question comes from Jacob Unruh of the Oklahoman. Go ahead, Jacob. Yeah, this is for uh, for Mike Boynton. Uh, Mike, you've generally been a guy able to bounce back through everything during your tenure here, and optimistic. Uh, the frustration's evident. How do you how do you bounce back from something like this? Um, this thing, this will not stop me from having success. All right. This is going to be another bump in the road and uh, seems like an encyclopedia full of bumps in the road, but we will have success. We just have to figure out a way to do it within a new scope of operation. And we're going to obviously fight this decision to some degree. I don't know what, I think we're going to have some discussions about exactly how to go about that, but 
I'm not the least worried about me or the ability of this program to be successful. In fact, every time something like this has happened, it's given me more conviction because I know when the day comes that we'll have a success, I'll enjoy it that much more. So the frustration and, and disappointment is, is real. And it's, those were some hard phone calls to dial up this morning. But at the same time, this program is going to be fine. And this isn't about me. This is about those players. I want to make sure that no other programs have players that have to deal with this stuff when they don't have anything to do with it. That's what I'm here for right now. But as far as me being able to bounce back, trust me, Jacob, I'll be fine and, and we're going to find success. Thanks, Mike. Our next question is from Kyle Porter. Go ahead, Kyle. Yeah, Coach Boynton, uh, I'm curious about how you, um, th this stuff is complicated. Uh, it extends back a number of years. How do you distill it down for a 19 year old, for a 20 year old to explain to them exactly what is going on, what's taking place? How do you, how do you talk to parents about that even of recruits of, of just kind of explaining all these different things that, that have been going on and, 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 and trying to get to the other side of it? Yeah, as you, as you may imagine, uh, other than the day I was hired, I'm not sure my phone has been as busy as it has been this morning. Um, and that's from current players, former players, um, supporters of this program, future uh, recruits. Uh, and so the, the thing I've always tried to do is be honest. I think that's helped me through, through everything that we've been through as a program in my time here. And that's all I've tried to do this morning. I don't have all the answers for them. Uh, what I've tried to do is be as transparent as we've gone through this process as I could be, uh, but I certainly didn't expect this to be the end result today. Uh, but as I have in almost every other case, I'll just be honest with them. Uh, I'll tell them that I care about them and I want what's best for them. And that, you know, for, for guys who may only have one year, maybe it's not Oklahoma State. Um, but I'm going to support them wherever they are. For guys who want to stick with our program, no matter what happens here in the next couple of months, then they're going to be a big part of the success story when we get to the other side. Thank you. Our next question comes to us from Carson Cunningham. Go ahead, Carson. Uh, yeah, for both mics, you both expressed uh, shock at the results. So how optimistic are you that the appeal process will go your way considering – you really were shocked at the result already. Walter, maybe you can answer that one first. Can you say me, Gavin? Uh, Coach Holder, are you there? I'm here. Coach, can you maybe answer that question? Yeah, I think uh, I'd probably be better. I think everyone would be better served to let Chuck address that because he's dealt with this on multiple occasions before and he has a better feel for what the odds are. So I'll turn it over to Chuck. I think in any, any regulatory body, whether it's the NCAA or some other body that has appeal process, any appeal is an uphill battle. That being said, we believe this is an unfair decision and that precedent doesn't support it. The, the, the standard is: Did the committee did the committee abuse its discretion in oppose in imposing this penalty? Based upon our analysis, this penalty does not justify. I'm sorry, the the, the finding does not justify the penalty, and we hope to make that claim before the appeals committee. Thank you. Our next question comes to us from Bill Haston in the Tulsa World. Assembled the geographic footprint extended from Texas to Canada. That's a million hours and a million miles. And, and then you had, you know, the uh, November video where you're celebrating in the staff meeting. You have a great start to the season. Then you hit a rough patch. You have a nice second half of the season. 
and now this. I mean, it just just the 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 roller coaster experience that you've had personally, and, and to have such a high high in November and high high at the end of the season, and then just to get kicked in the gut like this. I mean, is it? Uh, I mean, I, I maybe the, I shouldn't put words in your mouth, but it's it it from the outside looking in, it looks like you know that no coach could have had a more roller coaster last eight months than Mike Boyd. Uh, I, I don't live that way, Bill. Um, you've probably been around me enough to know I don't, I just don't operate that way. Um, yeah, this sucks. No question about it. This, I, I can't imagine, I couldn't imagine a worse outcome for our players than what we saw today, right? Um, and at the end of the day, those are the guys who this really matters for. They didn't deserve that ruling. And that's what this is about. This isn't about me. I don't like it. Um, but I'm going to be fine. I, I really will. Um, is it frustrating as heck? No question. And I got to get to the parents of my kids, uh, the players on our team, and, and kind of start getting their heads wrapped around what this all means at some point. Those won't be easy conversations. But at the end of the day, it's kind of what I get paid to do, right? Uh, to deal with stuff and to and to be ready to to um, deal with adversity, deal with success. Uh, I still feel very confident in our ability as a staff and my ability because of the work ethic that I know that I have to get this program to a successful place. And I feel like certainly there's been a lot of headwind, right? Uh, I thought I had the plane turned around and the wind changed on me almost. Right. <laughs> but that's okay. Um, when we get this thing where we want it to go, it's going to be a lot of fun. And uh, I'm not going to allow this to change me or my mentality about what it takes to have success. I'm going to use this opportunity to be better, uh, to learn more, and to figure out how I can change what I can see as an uh, undue process for, um, for, for adjudicating these 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 situations. This just shouldn't be the way it is for these kids. Thank you, Mike. Our next question comes to us from Nathan Thompson, Fox 23. Uh, I guess either for uh, Coach Holder or, or Chuck, um, I'm trying to get a feel for how hard you guys are, are fighting this. Um, if you go through the appeals process, and you lose that. Is that is, do you go to a court system after that, or are you going to stop at the appeals process? Jeff, you want to talk to that? Sure. the The NCA has the appeal process. We will take it through the NCA appeals process, and hopefully, we're successful. I I don't want to speculate on what would happen at the end of that if it was not successful. And one more thing about the appeals process. I, I was on the conference call with the NCAA and, and I was asking them about it. And they seem to intimate that it's not uncommon for a punishment to get lessened at the appeals process. Is that a fair assessment, do you think, Chuck? I don't know if I would use that adverb, but uh, I, penalties have in the past been modified and Again, it relates to the the standard. Did the commute? Did the committee abuse its discretion in imposing this penalty? And my guess is that that we would will look at previous cases, and as I mentioned earlier, focus on intent. And should it be classified as level one versus level two? And just the last thing, uh, obviously, you don't want to comment if, if you lose the appeal, but the courts is a is an opportunity that a school could take, correct? Well, but to, well, to the extent that anybody can take anything to a court, I guess. But that's again, that would be speculative, and um, I, I wouldn't I wouldn't speculate on what with what the university may or may not do at the end of the appeal. I think I'd rather focus our efforts on winning the appeal as opposed to trying to figure out what the next move is prior to that. Thank you. 
Our next question comes from Garen Emig of the Tulsa World. Go ahead, Garen. Okay, I think this one's for Chuck. And if I've got the, ver the term wrong, correct me. Uh, was there not in the aftermath of the Rice Commission uh, another body suggested to to uh, resolve cases like this? It's uh, the independent accountability resolution process, I believe. Is if if that's the case, did was that ever a consideration in OSU's process? You do have that right, and congratulations on that because that is that is a. Uh, uh, that's a new group, the IARP, and the and the and inst the school itself, the enforcement staff, or the committee on infractions can refer can can uh, uh, suggest or say we want this case to go to the AIRP. It's public knowledge that NC the NC State case has gone that route, and. From the institution standpoint, that was not requested. Uh, again, that's a very new process, and um, and and it was well, it, it was not the institution did not request that. Okay, and that and in that case, um, there's no appeal, right? If you go through the uh, the IARP, there's the appeal isn't an option. That's correct. That's okay. a and that's a very significant factor that um, that is considered before you go down that path. Okay, thanks. Our next caller is Ryan Novozinski from the Ocali. Go ahead, Ryan. Uh, hi, my question's for for Chuck. Um, if if the other cases that you were researching uh, were made for a competitive advantage, and this one was it, how much? Does that bode well for for the fight to get this appeal uh, and to appeal this punishment? Well, I guess we will see. The um, obviously, when we were going into a hearing, we didn't know. You, you don't know what the penalty is going to be. Again, we contested. We think very hard that this was a level two case, not a level one case. Um, so at this point. Within the last few hours, we'll start look. We we started looking at other cases, but again, I I I can't. I, I don't know uh, un, until we've had more time to to digest the decision. But just looking at a few, it seems that previous cases with similar penalties had much more intent or actual competitive gain or recruiting gain. Thank you. All right, are there any other questions? I don't see any other hands raised. If you do have a question, please raise your hand. Okay, to any of our panelists, Coach Holder, Coach Boynton, Chuck Smirt, do um, any of you have any closing remarks to send us off with? I'm, I might go if, and, and then see if coaches have anything. Uh, I wanted to emphasize something that I mentioned earlier uh, because uh, Mr. Parkinson in his NCA comments, he talked about cooperation and an institution has a responsibility to cooperate in the process, but that doesn't mean that you can't contest things in the process. And the institution did contest this I, I want to make sure that there's not the belief by the OSU supporters that the university didn't didn't contest. We had an agreed, we had a, a finding that was close. There was some dispute between the enforcement staff and the institution, but for the most part, you had a fine, you had a, a, a coach who took a plea bargain, and there was testimony it would have been difficult for the institution to say none of this happened. Okay, so it did happen. And then the, uh, then the, the next question came, what's the severity of this? And that was the sole purpose for going to a hearing was to contest the level of severity. So the institution 
the at university administration, they made the decision. It's important to our program and to the university to go and contest that classification. Thanks. All right, Coach Holder, Coach Boyden, any closing remarks? Well, this is Mike Holder. I'll just reiterate what Chuck said. You know, we've gone from uh, disagreeing with level uh, one and arguing for level two and then feeling like, well, if we don't win that, at least we'll get the mitigation for level one and there won't be a postseason ban. Now we're to the point where, yeah, we got the level one um, and we vehemently disagree with the postseason ban. So that's the disappointing part today and all the the significance for, I think, the, the real victims in this. And uh, some people may think that that's a mischaracterization, but I think in this whole dilemma, this whole three-year process, from the from the moment that FB, uh, the the uh, Southern District of New York uh, went live with that press conference, and everything that's happened in the three years since then, all the turmoil, the angst, the disappointment, the unknown, the dealing with all this factor, and then to come to today and just uh, and <laughs> be facing a postseason ban and loss of scholarships. Uh, it's just not anything that any of us was prepared to encounter today when we came to work. So uh, disappointment, uh, I think that's probably the best way to characterize how I feel today. And uh, hopefully we can, we'll figure out something tonight. We'll go to bed, get up tomorrow, and uh, tomorrow will be in another day, and we'll figure out a course of action, and we'll start uh, in a in a march toward a better place for Oklahoma State University in our basketball program. And I'm, uh, I'm very confident, given what Mike Boynton said today, you heard him, and then what he stands for on a daily basis with his leadership, uh, better days are yet to come. Thank you, Coach. Co Coach Boynton, any last thoughts? Uh, I don't, other than uh, I appreciate you all being on here. Um, and I, I look forward to seeing the day where, where you know, our kids and the people we're, we're asked to, to care for most are, are a little bit more considered in the midst of what we sometimes hide behind as process. Um, the process sometimes has to escape us for um, you know, common sense and compassion for, for people we're charged to care for. All right, thank you, Coach, and thank you to everyone for participating with us here today. We appreciate it.